And we can play the recorded version of, oh, yes. We can play the recorded version of this one. Thank you for letting us know, Will. Good afternoon. My name is Will Weaver, and today I'll be talking about voucher vision and the specimen label transcription project, two software tools that we are developing to automate the process of transcribing our barium specimen voucher labels. So this is a site that many of us are going to be familiar with. We have a herbarium specimen voucher, and we need to transcribe the contents of its labels into a database. Typically, that would be a pretty manual procedure where a person would sit down at a computer, look at the label, type out the contents, and then that would be added to a database. However, by introducing large language models and optical character recognition, we sidestep most of this manual process and create a little detour. And today we'll be talking about the transcription and OCR process first. Large language models are used in just about everything right now. And there's many different versions, but at the end of the day, they all generate, transform, or translate text. And they do so by predicting the next letter in a sequence based on the previous letter. They're highly complicated probabilistic models, and we can use them to do a lot of different things. So they come in two basic types. There are API-based models and there are locally run models. API models are generally more capable. They're easy to use, they're on demand. They have a low barrier to entry um, because they have a per transaction cost, you pay as you go. But there's a lot of disadvantages to using them too. Um, the APIs change frequently. The model availability might not always be there and they lack long-term support. Also, we don't really know what data these have been trained on. Alternatively, there are local models. The advantage of that is that they're often open source. There aren't recurring costs. They can be maintained locally, and we can even fine tune them to accomplish more specific tasks, but they're still not quite as capable as API-based models. They're difficult to implement, and they might require very expensive computers to run at an efficient rate. So how are we at the University of Michigan using large language models? We wanted to design a transcription workflow that minimized the changes to our current workflow. Um, so we want to use large language models in a way that augments, but doesn't fundamentally change our established procedures. And it should be flexible because we have different projects and those projects that have specific requirements. The first step in this process is extracting the labels from the image. We use Leaf Machine 2 to crop out the labels and put them into a single image. We submit that image to an optical character recognition algorithm, in this case, Google Vision API, and it'll return a pretty messy group of words like you see here. And this is why large language models are so important because they can help transform this text into something that we can actually use. Large language models require a prompt. So for voucher vision, we dynamically assemble prompts for each individual image. And that is comprised of instructions, the unformatted OCR text, JSON examples, and then parsing rules and a final structure. Instructions are basically just the tasks that the large language model must complete. And as we go through these, you'll see trip quotes and that just notes verbatim text that we would include in the large language model prompt itself. In this case, we're basically just telling it to restructure the unformatted OCR text into a JSON object with specific headers. We also add some more specific rules to this, such as column-based rules. Um, for example, the genus must be capitalized or all dates must be in a specific format. And these are based on the instructions that our transcription staff members follow um, for the manual transcription procedure. And we've just slightly adapted those for our large language model prompts. Next, we show it the OCR text that it will have to sort through. After that, we give it JSON examples. So we use a vector embedding search to find closely matching um, already transcribed entries. And then we turn those into a JSON object and show those JSON objects to the large language model as examples. And then finally, we give it a few more parsing instructions and show it an empty JSON dictionary that it can fill out. Once we've assembled our dynamic prompt, we can submit that prompt to our API or our locally hosted large language model. 
and that will return a response, which is a JSON candidate. Sometimes these large language models are not accurate at returning a specific JSON object, so we have to validate the procedure. If it passes, then we have a, a complete row in our spreadsheet. If it fails, we can do recursive prompting and have the large language model correct the error. After that, um, the model will process several hundred images. We usually process 500 images at a time. That'll create a spreadsheet, which we can then submit for manual review before we enter it into the database. If you'd like to try out voucher vision for yourself, you can go to this website link and see how it works. Once voucher vision has returned a completed spreadsheet, we can submit that spreadsheet to a person for manual review. To do this, we use the voucher vision editor. Um, so we developed this tool to help make review a lot simpler. So right here, we have the formatted OCR that the large language model predicted. Uh, so it's basically just reading a row out of the spreadsheet and populating a form so it's easier for us to manually review. We split up the contents based on topic. So we start with geography first, and then the uh, editor can edit the locality and then the collector information, and then finally review all of the information one last time before moving on to the next image. Also in our editor, we can show the raw OCR text. So if the large language model skipped something that was present, you can copy and paste the text, again, saving more time. And we can also group the OCR text by theme to make it easier to find relevant information when you have really long text labels. We can also display the original image in the viewer or the cropped labels. And then finally, we're also working to add many validation steps in the voucher vision editor to verify things such as the GPS coordinates, um, just to help increase the accuracy of our transcriptions. How does voucher vision compare to traditional transcription? Um, right now, we've observed a roughly 25% increase in throughput, but we're still working on more tests to figure out um, the true increase. Um, it is pretty affordable. It costs between five and ten dollars per thousand specimens using ChatGPT, but we expect to reduce that cost in the future by using locally hosted models. Have we observed many mistakes? Yes, the large language models do make mistakes, um, and we have quite a few different ways that we're working on to improve the accuracy by tweaking our prompts. Um, and we're also making the prompts more modular and responsive to label content so they can respond to different situations. Um, does this replace people? Not at all. Our curatorial staff and volunteers just end up typing a lot less, and they're transitioning to more managerial and review roles. And the goal is to make a bigger dent in our transcription backlog. Going forward, we're working on several different ways to improve the performance of voucher vision. Uh, we're focused a lot on prompt engineering. We've noticed significant differences just in the way you instruct the large language model to accomplish the task. Um, we're also using vector embeddings and cosine similarity search to rank the performance of different large language models, different prompting methods. Um, and in that process, we're also fine tuning local open source models to try to move ourselves away from corporate API based solutions. We're also developing benchmark data sets, and that involves collecting manually transcribed data sets from a variety of, uh, of different institutions so that we can create a gold standard to evaluate the performance of these types of methods. That brings us to the specimen label transcription project, um, which is primarily focused on developing benchmark data sets from a wide array of natural history collections. Um, and you're invited to contribute. Um, we have a growing list of collaborators on this project, um, and you can email me for more information. So what data are we interested in? We are interested in the human transcribed text that most closely matches the literal label text. Um, that most reflects the performance that we could expect to receive from using a large language model. Um, so these are critical for testing, validating, and improving large language model power transcription methods. And incorporating many institutions will result in more generalizable and capable methods. All of this data will be hosted and publicly available on Hugging Face. Here's our specimen and label transcription project page. Many more models and data sets are being uploaded soon. And I just wanted to acknowledge all of these amazing people and our funding sources. Thank you.
Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, and thank you for that for that link in the chat. Um, yeah. So we do have. I took my watch off. Um, we do have. 15 minutes set aside for discussion. Um, and we can use this time uh, to either ask questions about previous um, previous presentations, or if you guys want to just have a discussion about what we've talked about so far, um, that is completely fine too. It's very uh, open-ended. And I think I see a hand already going. OK. Um, Will? Is Will online? Will, are you still with us? Yes, Will is still here. Does anybody have any questions? I think you're safe, Deb. <laughs> Test. Or, testing one, two. Hi, Will. It's Deb. Nice to hear you and hear your voice. Thanks. I really like the fact that you pointed out the the hi <laughs> I see you there in the comments. Um, I was privileged enough to give a talk with Will at Botany last um, what was it July. So talking a little bit about AI, I'm interested in helping the community realize the value of what the changing roles of humans look like. So you mentioned that they will still be in the loop, um, and I wanted to take the opportunity as you and I got to share at Botany about is Elspeth are you here? Where are you? Yes, you're here. Stand up so people don't know you. Oh, I'm being bossy. There you go. Um, so going back to Elspeth's work, and those of you who might have been at Tadwig, we're talking 2014 here, I think, or 2013, the work of uh, Elspeth's colleagues, Robin and, and Rob, to work on what is it we can say when you can construct an organized data set for somebody versus giving you a novel label to transcribe every time your label comes up. It's from a different country in different handwriting. It's typed, it's written, it's a combination. It's different time, different geography. So as soon as you take the kind of things that Will just showed us, you can construct data sets or the users themselves can construct a data set that's contiguous around, for example, a geographic area or a collector or uh, a taxon. And now the human has the ability to take what they're learning from deciphering what they're looking at and apply that very effectively to the data set they're working on. Doer happiness. Yes, Elspeth? Yes. So she has research. She can tell you more about what that tells us. So it's not just about speed is my point. Because other people like the University of Alaska Museum of the North, Cam Webb, he built a tool to do this kind of work already. And he says it's not necessarily faster than somebody who's a really quick typist. But what it does give you is the opportunity to have humans interact with the data in a new way and to make use of their brain. So, Will, do you have any, have you seen that yet or been able to measure like user happiness? <laughs> He's answering, yay. We have observed that the editing tool is more important. Ah, yes, Elspeth wants to. Thank you. Yeah, I, I guess just in, in response to that, it, it kind of builds even more, it has more potential because um, what you find is that when people are working on a specific data set, they build up an incredible amount of really obscure knowledge. Um, and the you know, happiness, yet yeah, they love it, but also it means that the, the quality of their work is really shooting up um, and the accuracy. And, and you're getting a lot of extra, extra stuff that you wouldn't get otherwise. Um, but then what we can potentially do and what we should be doing is then feeding that back in. So then once we've got someone with all of that, that, that knowledge and they're actually enhancing those records, then if you start feeding that back in to almost a training model, then actually then you can start building the, the improved AI models, I would have thought. So that would be a really nice way forward, I think. Yeah, I totally agree. I don't know if people saw my um, presentation yesterday, but I'm our group at CSIRO here uh, doing 
it's called collaborative intelligence, so human AI collaborative intelligence, and the aim is not to replace humans, but make the best of both. And um, there's various terms going about humans in the loop or AI in the loop. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's a conversation at times. And as Will said, the editing tool, editing tool is very important because that's where the human comes in, and that can take place in various parts of this whole modified workflow and so on. And then, as you say, things like grouping related items together into projects where people's expertise, both taxonomically but also location-wise and uh, by individual collectors, uh, really comes to the fore. Um, as we probably, anybody who works in collections knows, there's, there's, there's very often transcribed locations which are incorrect because they didn't have the contextual knowledge of those places to get the right place. So anyway, thanks. Uh, following up on that same idea. So now Elspeth has given us the picture about how it helps the human and we can feed that data back in terms of things like data quality. Imagine the time it takes to find some obscure place on the planet, obscure to us, I apologize. It's not gonna not obviously be obscure to everyone. So think about Slack or something like that. Think about the fact that the US is having these conversations about biodiversity data action centers or what comes next after programs like IDIG Bio that some of you may be familiar with. So think about the value of having a borderless community that if there's essentially something like a Slack instance where they're geo-referencing something and they're doing this kind of work, then, oh, I figured out where this place in Papua New Guinea is or I can't read this handwriting. And now all of a sudden when they're looking at who can decipher it, who knows what this means or what that means, they're no longer limited to the borders of the collection world and the experts sitting around them in a given physical space. They now have access to all this knowledge that each individual around the planet is gathering. So, and they don't have to wait for it to go out the door necessarily to be published either. So we see this happening in microcosms, herbarium junkies on Facebook, Entro Translator on Twitter, um, you all can name other communities, but we ought to, I think, personally, be able to build a more integrated space through either Spinach or Tadwig or some combination where people could do this, share that knowledge together. I just thought I'd respond to that. Um, I have played around with asking uh, GPT, ChatGPT to infer latitude and longitude from localities and so on. And it's very interesting results and combined with an editing process, which includes being able to bring up the map of that space, uh, is, seems to me quite useful. So, there was a um, interesting paper, I think it was, uh, about how ChatGPT is building up an, I like an idea of Physi the physical worldview, which I remember reading about about a week ago or two weeks ago, maybe. Uh, does anybody else want to make a comment? <laughs> um, playing with it in the same vein, we had something like an obscure datum come up. We were like, what is this? Someplace that we didn't know. And I went and found the paper, which was over my head. I opened the map and it was explaining the, the, the whole projection and the map. And I thought it'd take me my rest of my life to figure out how to put what I have on my label into this formula and get something on the other end. I put it into chat GPT and immediately knew. It knew the datum, it knew the point to use to convert everything and gave me the coordinates and it was perfect, right, immediately. So, yes. I want to... <clears throat> I want to raise a slightly different issue, actually, and this might come across as a bit of a kind of downer issue, but nevertheless, I think it's got, I, I think potentially it's quite important. So through this process, we're giving these large language models lots and lots of really interesting and valuable information. And of course, we're getting great services at the moment back from these language models that we're starting to really be innovative and think about. But there are some risks um, not only in terms of 
the kind of data that we might giving to these language models that might expose those species, specimens to um, uh, further exploitation in ways that we wouldn't necessarily be terribly excited by. But also there is another risk about um, IP. This is the bit that people might struggle with a bit, but there is a potential risk around the intellectual property that's held within our collections that we might at least be wanting to engage with in terms of extracting that opportunity. And there are risks that we are giving that away by exposing all of our resources to these models. So I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm interested in that space because it's a bit of a concern for the UK government at the moment. But I'm wondering, is anyone else thinking about those kinds of problems or has anyone else thought about ways of solving that? So sorry if that comes as a little bit of a downer on what I think is actually really, really very exciting times for our field. Um, Vince, your, uh, the IP that you're talking about, isn't that publicly published uh, on GBIF already? Or are you, yeah, just if you could clarify that a little bit. So some of it is and some of it isn't. Um, so particularly thinking about the IP that might come from uh, the inference across the links of the data that we have, or maybe the images themselves. So the images in particular may be much richer. And so, for example, here's a, 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 the kind of service that we all dream about that you know may well now be possible but be possible in ways that wouldn't necessarily involve us or our community. So particularly thinking about kind of computer vision based identification systems. So we're almost at the kind of Star Trek point where, you know, you point your phone at something, it'll tell you what it is. It'll tell you with a fairly good degree of certainty. Now we haven't really plugged collections into that properly yet. There's some great examples where that is beginning to happen, but that would be a really interesting commercial service, maybe one we would genuinely pay for, but one that arguably our institutions might like to have some kind of stake in, uh, in terms of not necessarily the financial return, but the intellectual return on that. And at the moment, we would the model is we would not get that return because basically we're giving our IP away. That would be the kind of controversial suggestion. Yeah, I guess it's the same for artists and uh, writers and so on as well. Uh... Um, yeah, hi, Paul Flemons here from the Australian Museum. Um, whilst we're on the subject of downers, uh, Vince, something we're missing here possibly is also the citizen science side of things in terms of uh, we're actually asking people to contribute a lot of their time to uh, digitise uh, our collections, etc. And then we're going to train machines with those their efforts and then we're going to disengage them from the process by not needing them anymore. Um, so that's... Uh, <laughs> oh, that Siobhan's going to run with this somewhere. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so that that's... And I'm sure there'll be upsides to, to that as well, but that is something that... Uh, running a digitization platform that involves volunteers. Uh, yeah, Digivol is obviously going to be heavily affected by these sorts of activities. And we've got thousands of people that are engaged and contributing through William Brewster uh, diaries and things like that, where they've actually become very engaged. Uh, scientific literacy of the community is increased by those sorts of activities as well. So. I'll hand over to Siobhan and see what she's got to say now. But yeah, just it's another risk in terms of a community that we've engaged with and now uh, we're in danger of uh, unengaging with them. In my opinion, and on the upside, is that there will always be something for citizen scientists to do. It's just a matter of um, now the technology is moving on to find the other tasks that do the same thing of engaging interest and um, giving... Uh, the general public a way to actually, yeah, general public a, a way to actually uh, engage with collections. Yeah. Um, one second. So we are kind of at the end of time. I don't mind people continuing to be completely can, honest. Can, can I just respond with one? Oh yeah, yeah. 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 Just to, it would be good just to be conscious of that and take that into consideration when we're doing these things. So as we're actually bringing the citizen science community along with us rather than going, well, we don't need you for that anymore yet. 
So if people do want to leave, um, I mean, you can always leave your adults, but, um, <laughs> but if you would like to leave, we are officially at the end of time. But um, if you're cool with it, I'm okay with running um, discussion a little bit longer for people who want to stay. Um, Paul, Paul, directly addressing your concerns of uh, basically disengaging your citizen scientists. I do think there will always be cases like basically, say, collectors whose handwriting is especially cryptic, let's say, uh, not to use any kind of like valuating terms. And there will always be cases that require a human in the loop. And what these large language models or ever larger language models really do for us is take away the boring base cases so we can can invest our intellectual efforts in the cases that are let's say more borderline or um less regular so um i think like a collaboration of the automated approaches in combination with uh, citizen scientists in basically in a corrector, in a supervisor, in a curator role for this output, together with their corrections then feeding back into the model actually is a way of getting there. And I do not think we, well, not having too much insight into collections, especially in terms of numbers, um, but for what I've heard, I do not think we run uh, out of specimen labels to uh, transcribe anytime soon. So um, this might actually make the make the process more scalable and more um, and might speed it up in ways that we actually would want. So I don't think your concern is um, that validated. <laughs> so, so Paul, I was wondering when you said that. I know you have like and maybe it's different now, but Digival had the two layers of people who are ending data, people who are validating, right? Your validator layer. I can see your validator role increasing, more people playing that role. But the other thing that comes to mind in the digital humanities talk that we had was talking about the way in which data will be able to be visualized, which could allow the volunteers I think of the things like the way the astronomers ask the people to join and look for patterns. Look in this giant pattern in the sky, all these dots, and see if you see a cluster and mark that in some galaxy or whatever. So that so think of that as new ways to look at the data pile and have the users look for patterns in the data and say, oh, I see a Klein, or oh, I see a pattern with this date problem or whatever. They will be able to look at the data in ways and add their intellectual um, interaction in a way they couldn't before. Nicole wants to. Alan over here. Sorry, I'll just pipe up again and then I'll be quiet. Um, I, I agree, I think it's doing some of the donkey work and just, it's like using camera trap um, machine learning uh, models for getting rid of the blank images from camera traps and then allowing the, the, uh, valid, or the citizen scientists to, you know, go through the enjoyable task of of selecting the ones actually with animals in them. Um, and the same as we use machine learning models for any task, it's getting rid of some of the donkey work that we all have to do on a day-to-day -day basis to allow us to get to the interesting parts quicker. You know, I think that's the key for all of this. I've never heard the phrase donkey work and I will now add it to my vernacular. Also responding to Paul, um, we've got volunteers at the moment doing a huge number of the pieces of work that have been described here that can be done by AI. And I think we're in this kind of transition period where the really good AI costs money at the moment. The the less good, like we've, we've talked a lot about ChatGPT and the different versions of it, the really good one costs money. And we've just done a, an analysis of, a, of the, the big field diary project that we've just transcribed this year. And we've delivered a quote to the Queensland Museum and said, this is how much it'll cost to use these AI tools to transcribe this really quickly. And they went, but we could do it for free. And we went, yeah, it will take months. And they went, yeah, that option, please. So we're at that that level at the moment where I can see that, I mean, it, and maybe even with transcription, if you read to a, dic like if you have a sort of a dictation machine, you read the free field diary, that's faster than typing it out. So we're kind of, it almost seems nuts to transcribe a field diary manually still, like at this point in technology, but it's still 
at the moment at a museum where we are drastically having fat, cunning fat everywhere. I know. And my like we saw, we saw in JJ's talk, she said they're using AI to, to diagnose the page types. I've got the most amazing volunteers who've worked with us since 2010 doing exactly that who, you know, during lockdown came to me the day we locked down and said, what are we doing from home? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing from home. So it's really hard to not to even create enough work for these amazing people. So, yes, I will be, um, I, I want to keep them as well. These are people who are like my grandparents, parents now. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not as young as I used to be. They're like my parents. <laughs> um, I would just like to say that that might be the case in Australia, but in uh, South Africa we definitely have a deficit. So we have too much stuff to do and not enough volunteers. So it's not always the case. And, yeah, sometimes AI might be a good option. Um. Just a little um, twist on that, but I think also that's going to really affect motivation. So previously we were asking people to do this because there was no other way. Now there is another way. Is that going to affect the motivation of those individuals who engage in this? Happy to talk more about that in the future. Motivation comes in three parts. Autonomy, mastery, purpose. Three parts. So if you're asking yourself, what can you do? If you ask me to go to a website that says, please help us digitize these flowers, please help us digitize these rocks, whatever you want. But now if you say to me, here's this ginormous pile, digitize whatever you want. And I'm like, I want to do the diatoms from like this beach, my favorite place on the planet. So now I can create my own data set. So you've given me autonomy, right? Purpose. You've given me the way that I, I can go after the thing that I want, and that's my motivation, right? And the mastery is you're giving me an opportunity. I had somebody approach me from uh, South Korea who came and said his students are so excited by chat GPT and the things that it can do that he said he wanted it. I just gave that talk at Botany. He couldn't wait to get back to show them that they can work in the summer for him. They are so motivated by that that they're going to learn that skill within the context of the information that they're learning, what it will do, what it won't do, and what they can add to it. Thank you. Um, just I wanted to, wanted to answer directly to Nicole, in fact. Um, you say the good AI costs money and the not so good AI maybe doesn't, but then um, if you do this interactive process where you have like the AI do the donkey work, as we just learned, it might be called, and uh, have the volunteers do the more complicated cases and feed the work of the volunteers back into the model, as long as you control the model and run it on your own hardware, uh, that bad AI doesn't stay bad all, uh, always because um, it gets more and more specialized to the task you do. It might not be as general purpose as ChatGPT, but then if you run a label transcription effort, that might not even be what you want. So um, you, you improve your model um, over time by feeding back in what your volunteers do in terms of corrections. And in the end of the day, you have very good AI that is very specialized in transcribing your labels. So um, it's not about good or bad. It's just about how much pre-training has been done. Um, have we got any other comments or uh, questions, thoughts? Going once, going twice. Thank you so much for your contributions. Um, this was our second of three. We have another session tomorrow. Oh, not tomorrow. You guys will be enjoying excursions tomorrow. Um, we have another session on Thursday and we look forward to seeing y'all there next time.